Hey, it's Mara from Matter Hackers. Welcome to our inspiration session, how 3D printing will empower the next generation of inventors. You're about to hear from sixth grade teacher and Matter Hackers education ambassador, Jesus Huerta, on how he is using 3D printers to inspire his students to imagine themselves in STEM careers because 3D printers are so cool. You'll get solid project ideas and curriculum to take back to your school or library or makerspace. And I hope that we will inspire you to introduce 3D design and 3D printing to the young people in your life. Enjoy. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce an educator that I admire greatly, Jesus Huerta. Um, Jesus is a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing his uh, praises because sometimes he gets, sometimes he loves to talk about other things, but he never likes to talk about himself. Um, so I'm going to make that easy because Jesus is a sixth grade teacher at um, Calexico Unified School District. He is also the director of STEAM for Imperial Valley Q, and he's been the coordinator for Q Steampunk Playgrounds since 2017. We actually met at Q a few years ago. He was being honored with the Leroy Finkel Fellowship Award for what he was doing with students um, 3D printing assistive devices for recipients in his community. And since then, he's brought all sorts of innovation to his students, coding, VR, Zoom, 3D printing, design, challenges, planters, everything. Uh, Jesus is just amazing. And I'm so, so happy we're going to get to spend some time with him. So, Jesus, hi. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat and it says, don't forget my new puppy. I have a new puppy, too. That's my uh, other thing. We need to get the puppy out of the way. Uh, Let's get the puppy out of the way real quick. Let's just do the puppy. He's outside right now. So. Okay. All right. Well, stick around until the end, and <laughs> we'll introduce you. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I you want to go ahead and throw the slides up, and then um, uh, while you're doing that, just FYI, we're going to be utilizing the chat. So if you have questions, comments, you think of something funny to distract us, um, please uh, throw that in the chat, and we will have some time at the end to um, uh, to answer all those questions. Awesome. Um, so yes, basically, she, that's that's me. Um, just recently in March, I, I was awarded Tech Innovator of the Year for my county, my area for IBQ. Um, in particular, for one thing that we did, um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, here's how you can contact me through Twitter. There's my blog. You know, I forgot to put my email, but I mean, if you wanted to really get a hold of me. There's a couple ways you could email Mara or Tara and they will throw something at me to make sure I answer and, and I'll get back to you. So 3D printing and why teach it in your classroom? Um, there's a few reasons. And so I'm gonna go ahead and talk about it right here. Um, instant engagement, that's a huge one. Expanding lessons, teach soft skills organically without hitting kids over the head with it. Um, you can lead students towards entrepreneurship. There you go. Uh, and then really, I wanna focus on how it's this little machine, but the huge impact that it can have. Um, so here we have something that I did last year with my students. This is um, a giant fidget spinner that I 3D printed. And this is something that I do every year. I try to think of what am I gonna do to welcome the kids? And last year I was playing around with bigger nozzle sizes and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna print a giant fit as big as I can go. Um, I have a larger type printer, a CR10, um, but I'll talk about like four or five different printers that I have. Um, and I'll talk about the, the sketch because this one has really impressed me and, I, and I'll talk about it more later. So this was what welcomed my students last year before the pandemic, um, they had to spin it. So I would hold it, hadn't even said my name. They probably did or didn't know my name. And they had to spin it to go into the classroom. And some kids got all into it, spun it all hard. And they're already like, wait, what? My teacher not only had me come in by spinning, you know, fidget spinner, but this giant, where did he get this giant one? And that sets that tone, that curiosity. And I got them like that. They're already into my classroom. I use coins. And we're going to actually look at how to make your own coin today. And these are logos that I have for my blog and that I use for like my business cards or any presentations. Um, the kids see them because we do classroom currency and I'll talk about that later, like how I use it and we can discuss it. Um, but again, 
where where else are they going to see these coins nowhere else because these are my designs these are the ones that i made myself so again i have them they're being pulled into my classroom the other thing i love to do and this summer i'm going to work with um, at-risk kids with foster kids um the foster kids in particular i already spoke to the director of that program and said hey i want to make them nameplates he goes i can have that in like two weeks i go give it to me because i want to deliver these to them we're not going to do anything in person. So what I do is I get their names. And when they come into the classroom, I tell them, go find your desk. What do most kids see? You know, those little paper tents. All right, draw and design your own. Instead, they have to find this. And I'm at the door like, okay, spin it, go in. All right, hi, okay, your name. Okay, go, go find your name. And they're not even sitting down. They're looking around like, what's going on in here? What is this? And somebody will always come up and go, is this for us to keep? Yeah, that's yours. Are we going to make like, they start talking to me at the door before we even started? This is true engagement. Because most kids are like, oh, I'm scared or I school. I, I wish I still had summer break with this. They leave and they come back the next day and they're there ready to go. That's the kind of engagement we all dream about. And with one machine. Guess what? You have it now. Um, I took it a step further because the sixth graders I have now were actually my fifth graders last year. They looped over with me. And um, we had planned that even before the pandemic, but after the pandemic, for sure, because we were doing a pilot program before people were talking about Zoom and sending devices home, which was like a crazy idea. We had thought about sending home MacBooks. So my principal and I had the same idea. We should, you know, loop we should have me follow them into six because let's see what else they can do afterwards um i had pitched the idea of doing a print farm in my classroom one-to-one -one printers ender threes the kids build them pandemic kits we already ordered them they would still be in the warehouse right now but i asked you know what my director of um, aces the director of aces i asked her um what if we send them home what if kids pick them up, the survey parents ask them, hey, you know, are you okay with having the printer at home? Do you have the space for it? The Ender 3 doesn't take a lot of shelf space. And we have about 15 kids that took it, about half my class. The other ones, maybe two or three were like, no, I don't want to. And okay, you know, it, it's, it's not mandatory. But I did have a handful that were like, we just don't have the space. Because of the pandemic, you know, my nieces and nephews are here. So there's really like no room or we have little ones and nowhere to put it where they won't reach it. So the kids took it and virtually I taught them with a series of videos that I recorded, but also live. They were able to assemble them and really only two or three of them, something happened where they weren't able to be repaired. So they just picked up an extra kit and then they were able to see what they did wrong. So just something that I wanted to share that that can be done. And these are sixth graders that put them together. So just a quick little thing that I wanted to mention. Um, expanding lessons. Here's one of my favorite lessons that I love to do. And it's always my first lesson, first big project of the year. Um, I don't want to say I, I exclusively do project based learning. But for me, I always have a project running besides, you know, our daily math lesson and writing and so on. But with PBL, it encompasses everything. If you've ever done cardboard arcade, it's awesome because the kids will make these arcade games. You know, they'll do a claw game and so on. If you've never seen Kane's Arcade, it's a video that I share with my students every year. We do this project. But what we did was the area I live in, very rural, super low socioeconomic. So we have kids that don't have money. And they're like, what are we going to do for prizes? And I'm like, what can we do? Can we print items? These are the items they chose. These flexies, um, little coins, little tokens, little you know minifigures, everything they could think of. And what you're looking at, these are trophies. At the end, I survey every class. They get a little ballot and they throw it in the hat and I count them. And the kids are like, oh, who's going to win? Who, who had the best game? And it's funny because the, we do it for a whole week. Five days, five different classes are invited. And... We always get more classes asking. So what we do is we'll, I'll talk to the principal. Can we do two classes today? You know, but the engagement the kids are having with other students, the discussions, explaining their thought process. I can't find that in a worksheet or in a textbook. 
You can't pay for that. It just, it just has to happen. And so what happens is the kids get these trophies for best game every day. And it's funny, we go back into the design process because after that first day, they're like, we didn't win. Can we make changes to our game? So they're allowed to make changes on the fly. And some will be like, you know what? It was too easy. They were just taking all our prizes. It's got to be at least diff a little more difficult and satisfying and so on. So just by introducing 3D printing to this, I already got rid of the anxiety of like, oh, I don't, I, my family doesn't have money to go to the nine ant store, store and buy a bunch of prizes. We'll just print it, guys. Don't worry. And then they worry, well, Mr. Worth is going to cost you a lot. Oh, the, that octopus cost me a nickel. Oh, okay. Then they don't worry about that. I'm like, I can print like 200 of them. Don't worry about it. Let's just keep printing. Geography. I told my students, pick a place or I'll pick one randomly for you. Create a slideshow presentation. Do some research. Go up there and talk about this place that you want to go. If not, I'll help you find a place and hopefully it's interesting to you. I want it to be a goal of a place you want to go or if you've been there before. I did have a student that went to, the, the, that went to uh, Paris. Um, maybe it's a place you want to revisit. And they went into Tinkercad and they designed this Hollywood sign, Leaning Tower Pisa, a pyramid, Big Ben. You know, these are, this was last year, these were fifth graders. So I'm taking a lesson and adding something to it that they can't do any other way. And then they go and set the printer and they run it and, and everything. So again, taking a lesson that could be, hmm, and adding another layer by having them present. And then adding the ultimate layer of, you're gonna design it from scratch. Ooh, okay, so I have to figure out how can I make, how can I recreate it? Soft skills. Most kids don't know how to use hand tools. I had so many kids and so many parents say they've never held a wrench. It's funny, I had to teach them how to hold a wrench, how to use a, a, a ratchet, how a screwdriver works, how there's two different types of screwdrivers. What's a hex nut? Like they didn't know what all these things are. They're reading it, what's the hex nut? Oh, it's this. Oh, why is it called hex? Let me explain it. What's a stepper motor? It said something about a motor, what, what, what motor? There's no motor here. They're thinking of an engine like in a car. And it's like, no, this is a stepper motor. It moves, so it's a motor, it's in motion. Oh, that's why it's called a motor? Okay, and so now they're learning it, but I'm not hitting them over the head with it. Instead, they're learning it because they're actually working on it and using it. And here's the one that a student helped me build in class. File types, how come it doesn't print? Because it's a zip, what do you mean a zip? Hey, class, let's talk about, do you guys know what file types are? Do you know what a JPEG is? Do you know what this is? Did you know there's different types of picture files? Did you know there's different types of model files for 3D printing? What's a SD? When I say a micro SD, what am I talking about? I don't know. Isn't that just a flash drive? No, it's a card reader. So these little things that we use as adults, they don't know because a lot of them have grown up using a tablet or a cell phone or a Chromebook. Now it's like, hey, let me throw you into deeper water, something you've never really looked at or had to use. Now you have to start understanding it because you won't have success, successful prints or be able to print it all or convert files and so on. This was sold by one of my students. She is a student that is on the spectrum. You know, we, we allow her, you know, to do a lot of things on her own. She has structure and so on. But when she got that printer, they were like, she just fell in love with it. And they're like, do you mind that she's selling things to cousins and aunts or ask? No, I go, it's her printer, sell it. She goes, she wants to save up money for an art kit. Oh, go for it. She loves art. She also loves design. They go hand in hand, go for it. Have another student. She's like, my cousin asked me for a frozen castle for a friend and I showed her one of the models. Is it okay if I sell it for $8? I go, why not just make it an even 10? Oh, that's true. She offered 10. Go for it. She really liked the special color that I ordered. Some of the parents ordered extra filament ahead of time because they wanted unique colors. This one student printed it for my wife as a gift, but he's like, I sold like five of these to different ants because they have, you know, succulents, they have the mini plants. He's like, I, I sold it for 20 bucks and they're supposed to return their printers this week. And mom's like, he has like five orders. Can we hold on to it? I go, you know what? You hold on to it. So you're done with your orders. Oh, she's like, he's, he was stressing out. No, no worries. She goes, can you help me find him the right printer though? Because he wants one now. Because he wants to keep creating because he feels like this is going to be how he lives later on. Like how he's going to make a living. His business is going to be designing and selling. And I'm like, yeah, he already has it in his mind. I can just do this, make money. I love it. 
And so small machine, big scope. This right here was designed by a student that I had five years ago. Wait, no, four years ago, four years ago. Um, it's an amazing piece of work. And the print came, I, I made it really small. I mean, I have it here just so you can see how small I made it, um, just in case I could show it off later. But this is a student that was designing like this with me four years ago. And right now she's working with me again because she's considered at risk because her family, her, her mom and her and her little brother, um, they were in a women's shelter because of an abusive relationship between the father and the mother. They split up, no longer to see the child. But let me tell you something. She didn't act like she was being pushed down by that. She came in and was a breeze to work with, delightful, and my student of the year, my best designer. I had already decided that before I was told, you know what, we live here. And the reason that happened is she wanted to keep designing, but she didn't have a device. So I had an old fire tablet and I had an old set for my classroom. And she's like, can we borrow one? I'm like, yeah. She goes, I'm embarrassed to ask you. I'm like, no, no, why? Oh, she wants to design more. Oh yeah, I mean, I'll always help out for that. And she goes, does this work okay? I mean, my Wi-Fi is not that good where I'm at. Oh yeah. She, and she goes, can I be honest? Let me tell you why it, it doesn't work that well. We don't have the Wi-Fi and she explained. And I'm like, you know, your daughter hasn't explained that to me. She hasn't mentioned it. She doesn't like use it as a way to get out of work or anything. She goes, no. She goes, oh, I thought she would have told you. Every student is capable of this. Some will run with it, some won't. But let me tell you something, that machine those students that struggle, those students that need something extra, it's going to call to them. And I can tell you right now, I have a student this year that she's almost at her level. But then I come back and see her and I'm like, never mind. She just went up 10 more spaces up. Like she's way up here now. But it, it's amazing to see what they can do when they're just given that opportunity. And if there's time, I'll share more about her and some of my other students. But I just wanted to show you, she made this from scratch. There's an activity we're gonna do later here that she did where she made a custom planter and she found some skeleton hands and put it there, sliced it, put the skull there and she designed a little plate underneath. And I'm not sure if you can see it there. You can't, but I'll hold it up right here. She even put the hole so the water will drain out. And she's like, the water that fills up right here, she goes, I designed it like that. That way the water, I can go take it that's too much and put it in another plant so I don't waste any water. How many adults will design like that? I'm not gonna say zero, <laughs> not a lot. Cause we're just gonna be like, we're gonna think about it differently cause we already have that older mindset. And then some of us probably didn't have the design process throughout. And I'm very happy to say that where she ended up for high school, she landed at Mesa and STEAM programs and she's over the moon about it. The ultimate tool, not this, 3D printing is the ultimate tool. We talked about the different materials. Mara mentioned, you know, metal printers. Um, there's bio printing, skin, bone. Um, but this right here, 3D printed by my fifth graders about three years ago. Um, they didn't design it, but I told them, you have to figure out how to print it correctly. They got it. Okay, here's the assembly instructions. Hardest part for them, they don't know how to tie knots. I'm like, just imagine you're tying your shoes. Oh, okay. It's funny. They had everything ready to go, but they forget. You just do a knot. It's just like tying your shoes. Oh, okay. Boom. Here we go. Now this year, we're doing it again. So I gave them case studies or situations, however you want to call it. And one of them, it's a, it's a young lady who had paralysis of her arms, like she was frozen like this. She has surgery and can extend them more, but this hand is basically like a claw. So one group said, well, we made this for her and it can be modified to hold something. She goes, this is for a pin. So I didn't size it right for myself, but it would slip over my hand that's, that's paralyzed or even onto my wrist with some foam. So it's nice and tight. And they're like, she can write with it because she would write with her mouth. Now they're like, so she doesn't feel weird. She can feel normal. They put themselves in her shoes. I even threw a challenge out there for some of them. I said, what if there's a student that has ADHD? Can you help them with 3D printing? A sensation cube. 
the smoothness. Maybe they want something pointy, something a little rougher, something smoother, something bumpy, or just the flat side on the bottom. They're like, and they would ask me, because I've explained to them before, you know what, my son, he's on the spectrum, he has ADHD. I was diagnosed as an adult with ADHD. I told them, I'm using this at home. <laughs> when I'm doing things, I have it here at the desk and I'm, I'm messing with it. I was like, this is brilliant. And they're like, but it wasn't, it, it's, it's just that they, they don't understand that this is smart. They don't understand that this was brilliant. It's simple, it's elegant. But they're like, but we're sixth graders. It can't be that good. I'm like, no, it is. You have to understand this is awesome. And it, the confidence just flies through the roof. It's amazing to see what they're doing. So that's why you should 3D print. It'll change your classroom. If you already 3D print, you already know this. But if you have colleagues that are on the fence, show them this slideshow. Show them this video and say, okay, look, this is why you're in fifth grade or sixth grade or fourth grade. I know someone that down in third grade was using it. They really should have at least one or more. Because with a teacher mind, if I see a certain program, app, tech tool, if I see it, I'm like, wait, I can use that for math. Wait, I can use that for history. I can use that for science. I can use it. I can think of a thousand different ways, but I have to have it first and play around with it to understand it. So again, this is a, a game changer. Definitely have to have one in your classroom. I have a few and I'm going to talk about why in a bit. Okay. So let's say you're like, okay, well, how will I feel if I bring in 3D print into my classroom and start implementing it? Well, you're going to feel like this. I feel like this every day when the kids design. There's other things we do in the classroom. That makes me feel great too. Robotics, programming, coding. I, I blend it into my other lessons. But 3D printing is my specialty. And that's where the kids really shine. And we did a couple presentations yesterday on their assistive tools for, you know, the end of the year. This is for a young lady who cannot close her hand all the way. There you go. Now she can brush her hair. Oh, she doesn't need anybody to do it for that self-reliance, that, that confidence of I can do it now myself. She just got it from something that costs, what, not even a dime to print? A couple hours, a few hours? Look at this. Oh, it's on, it's on Tinkercad. We can share it for free to the world. How can a kid not feel like they can do anything after they've done some amazing work like this? That's the other thing. When they see this, when they hear how well they've done, when they recognize each other's designs, it's amazing. The classroom changes. It becomes something more than just a classroom. So we're going to look at a couple lessons to get us started. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. And what we're gonna do first is, well, do you wanna take any questions? Are there any questions in there right now, Mara? Do you want me to take questions right now first? Anything? We can take a little pause. Um, this is amazing. Just the chat is on fire. Um, we've got Nicholas who um, has been doing uh, assistance device, uh, who has been printing assistive devices. Um, and uh, fidget spinners, he's working with special needs kids um, and uh, sharing those in, sharing that information with the chat. So that's great. We were talking a little bit about, um, you know, from, from the Matter Hackers perspective, for example, like some of our biggest customers right now on the filament side are people that have Etsy shops. Like, so your kids that are designing, you know, planters or cookie cutters or anything like, that is a legit job. Like people, especially during the pandemic, have quit their jobs. I have someone that has 25 3D printers in her house. Like her biggest problem is her electric bill. Um, and you know, the, the pieces that she's making cost 19 cents and she's selling them for like six, nine dollars. And just and just make it like that is a job. Um, I know we're talking about, you know, really young kids, but when you say that you're teaching them soft skills and you're teaching them like, well, why would you want to have a 3D printer, you know, elevating, um, uh, I think it was Clayton, sorry, I might get the wrong, the wrong person. Um, somebody said like, how can I get my classroom off of just downloading things from Thingiverse and actually into designing and like teaching design is the key. Um, cause that's what you do in your jobs. That's what you do at SpaceX. 
that's what you do at as an architect like you you just showed us architects like your your kids are building buildings that's a job yeah um the entrepreneur to, to to what nicholas mentioned um he said that you know they donated printers to kids my son is special needs the regular classroom is not his real classroom he he goes and he knows what we're expecting but here we give him access to a lot and he at, at six years old, seven years old, he was able to figure out how to piece together two parts because he wanted to dress up like the predator. He had never seen it. And I taught him how to size it. And I go, well, do you think that's the right size? And he was playing with the measuring tape. And we talked about it at seven. And guess what? He was running around for a summer with a predator mask and the claws that he had helped figure out the size for. For, for some reason, this calls to those kids, the ones that have a troubled background, that are special needs. I have one that animation, he's dynamite. Reading, math, but I he's an animator. He will be an animator if he has the right path for him. And so Nicholas, what you what you're saying is is that's you're making me want to cry, the fact that you guys did that. But also something that you said, um emotion from creation. That's powerful. That's powerful. I, I love, I love that little quote. Um and it was uh, Mark Perlman, sorry, who was uh, trying to get his second, fifth, and seventh graders to move beyond uh, Thingiverse to da uh, downloads to doing CAD. So hopefully we've given you some ideas already so far, and we haven't even started the lesson plans yet. Um, so we will we will get into that. Yes. Okay. So we'll continue, and then if we have more time, I think we can do a small Q and A. Hopefully we have time. Yeah. So what yeah. I wanted to show you is something that I love using in my classroom, which is creating my own coins, but then I have the kids create their own, okay? These are student created right here. You see a flower, butterfly, Iron Man, Spider-Man. I'm not sure which one this is right here, but again, how do we make our own? So I do use this one, SVG creator. Oh, it did work. Okay, so let me open another tab. Um, the first thing we have to do is create what's called the SVG, okay? And that file we're going to take into Tinkercad. Now, before we go into SVG Creator, we need to find a silhouette. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go into Google. I'll use Spider-Man again. And just type blank silhouette, Darth Vader, Star Wars, Pony, something. And I want you to find a silhouette. The reason is, when you take a picture and convert it to an SVG, when there's a lot of colors, like my background, it would probably go crazy with it. Instead, this solid black and white image converts perfectly. Okay. So what I'm going to have you do is first find a nice silhouette. Go ahead and do that right now. Okay. And just go ahead, right click, save it as. Just go ahead and save that. And just the first one you see, yeah, this one looks like it'll work. Something simple, be really quick about it. And here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna put this link in the chat. So once you have your image in SVG Creator, you're gonna scroll down and just select your image and then hit convert. And you're gonna get a little preview of it. And then just click download. Okay. Oh, plus, we're going to give you guys access to the slideshow. One of the slides, I'll show you which one it is right now in a second. There's a link to a video that shows how to do all this. Okay. So if you get stuck or, hey, I'm in my car, I can't really follow along, don't worry. There's a way for you to do this later on. Okay. All right. So once you have it downloaded, I'm going to ask you to go into Tinkercad. Now, if you've never used Tinkercad, and I saw a question earlier, how do I take kids from Thingiverse? If you've never used Thingiverse, I'm just going to demonstrate what that is real quickly. It's a place where I can just do a search for, you know, Spider-Man. And I'll find models that have already been created by somebody else. Now, this is cool. Some, I, it's one of the first things I show kids, and they just have them pick something, and we'll print it for them so they can see, you know, oh, something I chose, I printed it. Okay, I'm gonna you know give this child an opportunity to run the machine themselves, the slicer, and so on.
but then we got to move forward. And to move forward, we want to leave Thingiverse to the side, not behind, because we're going to use it later on today also. But instead, we want to bring them into Tinkercad. And I'm going to go ahead and log out just so I can show you how to sign in. And your students can sign in the same way. And it's super easy. If they don't have an account, don't worry. Don't tell them to click join now. Have them sign in. And look, what, 99% of schools use Google Classroom, right? Sign in with Google. Pick your account. They'll get a tutorial and I think it'll ask them, okay, you know, we're gonna collect, you know, information or, you know, share this information and so on. Yes, okay, great, boom. The kids will be here. Go ahead and sign into Tinkercap. And you're, you'll notice I paused for like a few seconds just to give people a chance to get caught up just in case, you know what, my computer was lagging, my internet's hanging, okay. So once we're here, we're gonna go into create new design. So we have our workspace. So you might be tempted to bring in that SVG file. Not yet. Here's what I want you to do. Over here, just a quick you know, tip. Here's all the different categories they have, but we're gonna leave it on basic shapes. And I want you to scroll down just to right here and click once on cylinder and then click here. You don't have to drag, you just click and then click. And so we have our cylinder, we're gonna turn it into our coin. Now, when you click here, you have all these curves, what do they do? Oh, okay, they let me change the size and so on. Okay, that doesn't look right. Do I, do I have to delete it? No, just like a document, I can go back. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, how do I get it to keep that perfect round shape or perfect square shape? hold shift on your keyboard and then use this white square to drag it don't worry about it getting taller we're gonna make it shorter in a bit just make it kind of big like that okay larger great now if i want to zoom out i can use the wheel on my mouse or i can click here so let me have you make it nice and big like that first okay and i'm gonna wait a few seconds and i'll move forward okay is this we've got a quick question in the chat maybe while people are uh, catching up sure. Um, what is the difference? So someone was asking, um, why don't you just teach a full blown engineering class? What is the difference between bringing 3D printing into a general classroom where you have like stuff that you need to teach anyway, and you're using 3D printing to teach those things versus actually doing a full on engineering class? So I, by, by trade, I'm, I'm a multiple subject teacher. That's my credential. Um, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I taught math and I love math, but I didn't like teaching a single subject. Once I was in multiple subject and I started teaching with all these tools, robotics, VR, AR, um, engineering challenges, design challenges, um, implementing art in different ways, where it was part of the, the lesson that hit those standards that you know every you know admin wants us to hit. Um, I felt like I was reaching more students like that than if I was just single subject. Now, would I teach a pure STEAM class? Sure, if I was asked to, I would teach pure STEAM. But if I left, say, as a tech coach or went off to teach just STEAM, and they asked me, oh, come back into the regular classroom, like a fifth or sixth grade classroom, I would still do this because, first of all, the engagement. That's why I do this. As soon as they see this, they're like, oh, it's something different. Oh, awesome. Or I've seen it before, but I've never used it. The fact that the kids recognize this isn't the norm, it really, really brings them back the next day ready to go. And for me, it makes the day go by faster, but not in a bad way. I feel fulfilled because I'm not having them there fill out a worksheet. Okay, let me stamp it with the star. Let's go through the motions. I'm Who's going to be my designer this year? Who's going to be my superstar? Who's going to be the student that needed that help, that extra thing? And I have it. If it's not 3D printing, maybe it's animation, maybe it's something else. Um, but I mean, I would teach it. But the reason that I implement it is it takes all these other subjects that they need to learn that are awesome and elevates them. That's why I do it. The elevation is the biggest part of it. Hopefully that answers that question. If not, I can try to, if they want to ask it differently or if that's perfect, then there we go. 
No, I think that's good. I think the other thing that you and I talk about a lot is equity and inclusion for for steam. And I think that like, you know, there's a there's a joke that keeps coming up that more engineering is done in uh, backstage in a theater shop than in an yes. engineering class, <laughs> which is just truth. Um, and it's just that it's it's when you do bring um, 3D printing and design into more of a general space, you are introducing people who would never sign up for an engineering class. And you're introducing it and showing them that this is an access point if you want to design buildings, if you want to design planters, if you want to design jewelry, like what if you like Spider-Man coins, like this is you can use 3D printing and you can use design and you can use these engineering skills to do that. And they never would have seen that before. And and to add to that, um, I have a student, it is one of my girls. She built her printer on her own using the videos. You know, she she came every day. One of my top students, not one of my not one of my students of the year. Um, the mom texts me. She goes, "I want to cry." She goes because she came out of her room and said, "Mom, look what I built, and it's working." She already leveled it and was printing successfully. She goes, "Mom, I'm going to be an engineer when I grow up." She's like, she would talk about being a teacher or a nurse. She goes, the, she told me like the typical jobs that I hate to say it that women are kind of expected to do. She goes. I never would have thought I heard I would hear her say I want to be an engineer. She's like I don't know how to say thank you. That's we've talked about it before, Mara, right? And okay, I can retire now. We have those moments as teachers where we're like, I did my job for today. I did my job for this year. I can retire now. Of course, I'm not. But those are the things. Those are the impact. That's the real impact right there. Because she has this goal now, be an engineer. No matter what, she's going to aim for it. Oh, I have to get better at math. I'm going to do it because I want that. I want to be that engineer. And so that's the other reason, because if I use just the subjects, then they're going to be either like a writer or a mathematician, but that's not really a job per se. Instead, it's like, well, what do you want to do? You want to be a sound engineer? You love making music or do you love art? So do you want to be a tattoo artist? I have one that his father's a tattoo artist and he didn't realize how good an artist his son was. And he's like, well, how's he going to make money? I'm like, how much do you pay your tattoo artists? Because he has shops. He's like, that's true. He's like, I would have never thought about it because he's so young. I'm like, just keep feeding that passion of his. And that's my other goal. Give them so many options that they finally say, you know what? This is it. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know it existed, but now I'm going to walk down this path. Okay, so we'll talk about that more in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap in about 10 minutes and take some more questions. So uh, definitely keep those questions coming in the chat. So right here in the center, there's a white square that makes me, that allows me to make it taller or shorter. Let's make it a little shorter, like right about there, okay? Cool. And if I, and you'll notice I click a lot on the sides. That's how I deselect. Because Tinkercast sometimes will think you selected this. Oh, when you clicked on this, you want me to, grab both at the same time. So I like to click off to the side a few times to deselect. When you click here and drag, you're going to move it. So go ahead and move it. And what I want you to do is make a copy of it. So click on it and click duplicate. And then you have two of them, right? Once you have your duplicate, hold shift and make it a little bit smaller than the other one. Okay. Then I want you to make it taller and then use this cone to lift it up. What we're gonna do is put it on top of the other one so we can create that little lip or groove that a coin usually has or some coins have. So I'm gonna drag this over here and you can see, oh, it's way too high. So I'm gonna lower it and I'm gonna see it cut into it. And so now what I'm gonna do is move this over, kind of center it. And so now it looks like a birthday cake, right? Okay, so hopefully you made it a little smaller, put it on top. The reason I tell you to lift it up a little so it doesn't bleed through. And what I want you to do is click on the side, select that top layer and then click hole. Okay, so where, where's the hole? Well, what you need to do now is click here and select both items and click here where it says group. Hey, there's that little lip. 
So now we're going to import. And it's right here. So when you go to import in Tinkercad, it'll say it supports these three. STL, most common, OBJ, and the one that we just converted, SVG. So you're going to go ahead and pick choose file. Hopefully, you can find that file pretty quickly. And the cool thing is you get a little preview of what it was. And then click import. Spoiler is going to be gigantic. But guess what? We're going to zoom out. Click over here, select just our giant item, and then again, hold shift so we keep its original shape so it's not distorted. And I want you to make it pretty small, drag it over here, and then resize it again, okay? Now, it's gonna get lost though, if it stays that thickness. Look, where is it at? Oh, it's over here. So what I want you to do is, again, use the square in the middle, raise it up a bit, and then I want you to lift it a little bit. And then I want you to place it in the center. And then again, if you need to resize, I got to resize mine a little bit more. I want you to make sure that you can see mine's floating above it. I want you to make sure it cuts into it just a bit, like right there. And then just adjust the height to where it makes sense for you. So you're gonna resize it, move it, change the height, lift it a little bit. So it sits right on top and make sure it, it carves into it or bleeds into it a little bit. And then just select everything and you got a coin. That's awesome. And you know, I, I love that, uh, you know, the, the title of this, um, presentation was, uh, you know, uh, the, for then it's for the next uh, generation of inventors. Um, how 3D printing will empower the next generation of inventors. <clears throat> and I love that you've demonstrated how your kids are inventing new, not only new versions of things, but completely new um, assistive devices or solutions to problems. Um, and you know you got to start with I me mean, look i sing in cover bands it's all about you start with imitation but then you know you get your vocal skills up and you get your songwriting skills up and then you go and you make your original thing it looks like it's the same you know same rules apply when you're talking about you know starting with something in tinkercad there's nothing wrong uh sorry with the uh, uh, thingiverse there's nothing wrong with having kids start by uh downloading something that they're passionate about and printing it out they get the bug and then they go in and they modify that thing. And they're like, wait, if I can do that, I can do anything. And then you've got an inventor. Like that, that's the whole deal. My, my method of, of introducing any tech is here, just play with it. Easiest way is just what's your favorite animal? Because some students are going to have that mentality where, OK, give me the worksheet. Let me read the pages and annotate it. I don't know what to look at. What's your favorite animal? You know, I like wolves. Oh, look, there's this medallion order. Okay. They don't have to figure out what does each button do. It's just find something. Now, let me teach you how I take it out, put it in a slicer. I'll pick somebody. Okay, let's, let me have you walk through it. Oh, you got it now? You're going to help the next person. You two will help the next group. And then, prison, they all understand how to slice and use the machines. Okay, then we can go into designing now. Let's go into Tinkercad. Let's remix and so on. So, so there's a question in the chat actually uh, about that. Do your students ever use code to create 3D designs? No, they they are not experienced enough with code. Um, there is one called BlocksCAD. Mm -hmm. They use block programming to design items that can be pulled out and 3D printed. Um, it's amazing. And then that one, you can hit like a switch and you can see the actual code behind the blocks. Um, and then there's a few other programs that you can use code but they're, they're not there yet with coding. And since we don't have like coding class where they can, you know, start learning the basics and progress, um, I throw as many things as I can at them at a level where they're comfortable. If they move faster, I move faster. If I need to slow it down, I slow it down. But that, that's something I would love for them to do, but it's just, it, it just where I start with in fifth and sixth grade, a lot of them, they don't have any experience at all with most of this tech. So, but it's a good question. Um, so let me go ahead and share with you. So 
in this presentation, you just see the first steps are kind of written out for you. But if you click here, there's a video of me talking. Um, there is another one. But what I'm thinking, uh, Mara, is I want to talk about the sketch first, maybe answer a couple of questions. And if we have the time, come back to it. But what this is right here is remixing. I took a helmet from Star Wars and turned it into a planter for my wife. It even has a hole, a couple holes on the back, so the water will come out, any excess water. Um, seconds. Yeah, let's talk about hardware. Yeah, and you're going to hear a lot. As you go more into 3D printing, you'll hear the word remix. It's not this little kitten on the, on the one and two. But instead, it's taking something that already is created that's put out there for free and then giving it a different function. Okay, I put a loop on it, now it's my keychain. You know, I put a couple of holes into it, and now, like I said, it's a planter. Um, I turned it into a bobblehead, and it wasn't even close to being a bobblehead. That's something that I love Thingiverse for, because we do um, custom bookmarks. And we take a bookmark that already exists that has a good bottom piece and replace the top. And I've seen kids put, you know, something that's not 2D, like flattened out. They leave something that's three-dimensional, like a st stormtrooper's head on top, and they have a difficult time figuring out how to get it to print properly. But I give them the opportunity to try to figure it out before I show them, you know what, this is what I would do. And so if you click here, there's a link to a blog post. It has, you know, some steps written out, and it also has a video that you can follow with also. All right. So if there's a chance, we'll come back to this. But, okay, so how do we 3D print? How do we get started? Where do we go? So I wanted to talk to you about this awesome printer, um, the Sketch from MakerBot. Um, it's amazing. It's very easy to use. And I'm someone that before would be like, whoa, you know, we got to save money and pinch pennies. But if you're going to put one in your classroom, this is the one I would put in there, especially if you're like, ah, you know what? I don't know how to build a 3D printer like a kit. I'm not comfortable. Get this one. You know what? I need one in clothes that's easy for kids to learn to use. Get this one. Because of the features, because of one thing in particular, I have a printer here. I haven't been able to level it properly. I don't know if there's something wrong with the, the print bed or something else. I, I got a couple of days already that I'm like, okay, when is this going to print properly? With this one, if it doesn't print properly, I go in, adjust it, and that first time I adjust it, it's ready to go. So it's very easy to use. So we mentioned earlier, they sell them one or in pairs. Something that I did want to talk about. Let me grab my handy dandy iPad. There's math to having more than one 3D printer. And I say the math, what I mean is, let me go ahead and share my iPad. So if you have one printer, so let's say you have one, and me, I have 33 students, but I'll say 30. Let's make it a nice round number. I have 30 students, okay? If I have one printer and I create a one hour limit, so that means, hey, that's a three hour print, so you gotta scale it down, first of all, now the kid's like, well, it's supposed to be kind of big because it's like a little box to store my uh, Switch games. Sorry. Okay, so they have a one-hour limit. That means I need 30 hours. Let's say I don't want to leave in print overnight. I could maybe do six prints a day. So that means student A will print on Monday. And then probably the following Monday or Tuesday. But there's also this thing. Okay, they, they got that one hour limit. What happens when I have two printers? Well, now let's say I keep that one hour limit and I got those 30 kids and I need to print in 30 hours. Well, it doesn't mean it's gonna take me half the time. That kid will actually probably print the next day or early Wednesday morning because now I'm able to do 12 prints a day so 24 on the 24th one is done on Tuesday, Wednesday, kid A is already printing again. Well, what happens if I have four printers? Let's say you buy two sets of these, or you have access to other printers besides getting a couple of these. Well, maybe I don't need 
a time limit anymore. I can get rid of it. Or let's say I do keep the one hour limit. Well, I got 30 kids, so I need 30 hours, right? Well, in one day, now I'm printing 24 items. Kid A is printing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, probably every day, basically, is printing. So I would say, yes, start with one. But for me to really hit you know, every child, and I don't mean hit them, hit them. <laughs> I mean, to be able to have an impact on every child and give them access to it, yes, have more than one. But if you're on the fence, like, is this something that I'm really going to use? Or, you know, I'm not sure. Okay, start with one or start with a pair and start thinking about, wait, how am I going to use it? Okay, we're going to use it as a supplement to some projects or to some assignments and so on. Once kids see it, they're going to ask, can I print something for my mom? Can I print something for my dad? And you're going to want to say yes. And then everybody's going to want to print something. And when they ask you on Friday, is it my turn yet? And you're like, man, this kid printed on Monday and it must be like an attorney for them. That's when you start thinking, okay, I need more printers. Me, myself, I have six printers of my own, but I have about eight or nine sitting in my classroom right now that we're going to use next year. We're going to try to do either one-to-one -one or buddy them up where they share a printer. Um, but from what I was told, it's basically going to be one-to-one. -one. And we're going to put them on the walls with some racks. The kids will manage them. They maintain it. It's theirs. If it breaks down, I'll teach them how to fix it and make it a class activity. How do we fix this? What's wrong with it? How do we figure out what's wrong with it? Do we really need to order a part or is it, or is it a setting we're not looking at? So one of the awesome things about it that I wanted to talk about, and I have it right here. Where did I put you? I put it down. Is the build plate. If you've used other printers, some have like a glass base or just a regular metal base. And you got to use a spatula and you got to scratch at it. Sometimes you ruin the bottom part of a print like this cube right here. I would hate to hit it with a spatula and dent one of the corners. Instead, you have a flexible build plate, which I know I had it right now. Give me one second. Oh, it's right here. Hold on. So with this one, what you do is you just give it a little bend. If you can see what I'm doing. And it'll just pop off. If I know there's someone that has a Prusa. You're probably like, yep, you know what's up. Uh, having that flexible build plate just makes it so much easier to take items off, makes it faster. You're not gonna hear the kids you know, saying, hey, I hit myself against my print. I'm trying to get it off. I cut myself. Nope, they just pop it off. The awesome thing also is, you. it comes with three of them. When you order the pair, you get three of them. Um, so you could just take it out, put it in another plate. All right, kid, you're next. Go ahead. Uh, you know, Miguel, when you're done, come and take your print off. I love for them to take their prints off because it's a little experience for them. Even at the end of the school year, they're like, oh, I get to take my print off. Oh, I get to take off the support. It's very satisfying. So the other plus, it's enclosed. Your district might say, look, we want to get a printer, but it can't be open like some of the kit ones, like a Prusa like a CR10, Ender 3, and so on, this one's completely enclo enclosed. So touchscreen, very easy to use. Kids love it. The other printers I mentioned, I'm used to them, but sometimes I'm pushing the knob and I'm like, okay, why isn't the button activated? Okay, why is it skipping the one I want? You know, I got to get at the right click to land on the item I want to print. With this one, it's boom, 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 go. I'm ready to go. I need to find the settings. These other printers, all right, let me move the wheel and find, nope, with this one, no. It's, it's very easy to use. And I want you to notice right here, to load the filament, I just, when it says to load, just put it in place, takes it in, I see it coming out, I'm ready. With these other printers, same thing, I have to push it through the whole way. All right, let me give it a little push. Should I push harder? Why isn't it coming out? And so on. Again, very easy to use. Maybe you're still not sure, like, okay, I got it. 
okay, I went to a couple webinars, but I'm still on the fence. Like, how do I, how do I use this machine? I'm still fuzzy about it. When you order them, you get certification. You get some materials to use for yourself and with your students. Okay. So you, the learning continues, you get the machine and you're not going to be left stranded with it. And okay, well, what do I do now? There's a hub for you to go and continue learning to understand it completely, not just the machine, but 3D printing in general. One of my favorite features, cloud printing. Don't need to install a program. So if you have Chromebooks, kids just jump on to MakerBot, find the printer, load it and go. Other cool feature has a camera. So the kids can see it working from their desk or they can look through the clear panel right here and watch it work. Hey, let me stop sharing. Any questions right now? We did have a question. Um, this was awesome, Jesus. Thank you so much. Is that it for the slides? Yes. Good. Awesome. Um, I'm so glad you actually touched on those certifications. Um, because you do get you get two seats in the teacher certifications, you get 10 seats in the student certifications. Um, and with the print, uh, the, the cloud queuing, like it really does make it so easy. The other thing you were uh, mentioning before about funding and about like finding money for or you were saying how you should get, you know, a number of 3D printers. And my immediate thought is how is everybody going to find the money? Uh, MakerBot actually has a really great um, uh, resource for finding grants. Like, it's awesome. I wish I had a superpower of just giving this thing to everybody. So I have a copy of it. I can't put it in the chat, but email education at matterhackers.com. Uh, mention, you know, Jesus webinar grant. where do I get money? Um, and I'll send you a copy. It is so useful and so valuable. And we were talking also earlier about getting um, buy-in from your administration. MakerBot has another resource that's all this research from 20, I think it was from 2019 or 2020, it's really recent, um, that really paints the picture of why 3D printers are useful in, in, um, in classrooms. So I'm happy to send all of those resources. Just email education at matterhackers.com and, um, and I'm gonna hook you up. Um, the question that we have here is, um, do you have, oh, there's a quick question on the coins. Um, what is the size or height um, that you typically make the coin for your students? I have that somewhere. Um, I have one here. And, and really, I make them a little bigger than usual. Unless I switch out my nozzle and I make them really, really small. I mean, I can go smaller than this. This is about the you know, a little bit smaller than palm of my hand. Um, most of them will come out probably half the size of this, but really it just depends on what they chose. If it's something that's high detail, then, you know, I, I'll try to make it a little bigger. So if it comes out kind of ugly, I'll reprint it for them, but a little bigger. Um, but usually the size of a coin, maybe a little bit bigger, about maybe like a half dollar size. Yeah. And then another uh, question that we had that came in a private message. Um, how would you use 3D printing for uh, non-conventional subjects like English or language arts? Just like one, one example. Let's say I'm having them write, a, like one of the one of the projects, one of the projects, one of the activities I'd like to do for them is I'll start a story for them. I'll give them the first paragraph. Um, like recently I did one where, you know, a queen someone arrives and gives her a gift and the box opens. And that's where I end what I wrote, the first paragraph. And I tell them, everybody jump in and finish the story on your own. Okay, what do I do here? Well, okay, so I have questions. Okay, can I name the queen? Do I have to give her a name? Okay, can it be scary? Can it be funny? You know, could she try and travel? Okay, whatever, yeah, yeah. Then at the end, easy, I'll say, all right, now I want you to go into Tinkercad and create one of the main characters and 3D print it. And so I'll post it on the wall you know, put tape or, you know, or put it on a desk or one of the tables and here's a story. So when the principal comes in and sees like, you know, the queen, what is this? Or what is this little castle that they designed? Oh, there's a story. Oh, who, whose castle is this? Guess what? A parent comes in, teacher comes in, someone else comes in. They're, they're caught by this and they're like, wait, there's a story that goes with this thing? And there you go. Um, if they have to say they don't want to do a presentation, they want to do a straight up research paper, like, look, I just want to type up the information, 
and maybe read it off a script or just, I don't really want, I don't feel like presenting, I have anxiety. Okay, type it up for me, but now add that monument. So that presentation that they did for geography, they had to do research. They had to cite it. This was last year in fifth grade. Um, find me good sources. We would pick random people and pull up their source and go, is this a good one? This is, no, come on guys, it's not a good source. It's some guy's blog. No, we need better information. Um, but the other thing that, that, like I said, right there, them speaking, that's, a, that's one of the standards, speaking and listening. And I also have them you know, take the item and okay, what is the, the monument that you chose? Oh, was it in your slideshow? Yeah, okay, well, what is it? Oh, I did, you know, Big Ben. Why is it called Big Ben? I don't know. So then you didn't do your research, did you? Or, oh, it's called Big Ben because of, and a lot of times, 90% of the time, the kids will have done their homework because they want to find information on the model and they're catching that extra information on the site. Or they're watching a video and they're capturing that information by listening. Um, if there's questions like that, like, well, how would you implement it here or there and so on? I mean, I, that's definitely something I can answer now. Um, the biggest thing is having them reflect. If you want to get writing from 3D printing, have them reflect on it. When they do Kane's Arcade, I have them reflect. And one of the questions I ask them is, did you use a lot of 3D printing? Yes or no? Most of them are going to say yes, because a lot of them will get their prizes from there and little attachments to whatever their game is, like a whack-a-mole. They needed a mallet. So they brought home a paper towel tube and they made the mallet part and then they taped it and they had a mallet. And somebody was underneath pushing up the little moles. That was how the whack-a-mole was powered, powered air quotes. But afterwards, they each member wrote about that. You know, oh, I was the person underneath. We should have used something different because they hit me one time or it was great, but it was too easy. But and they always come back to the printing. They always start talking about it. So yeah. Yeah. I could definitely send you that Clayton. If you send me your email address, I'll send you a file, that file for sure. Awesome. Well, I think we need to um, wrap up in the next minute or so. Um, this was awesome. If there's any last, last, last question, um, otherwise um, we're gonna send out. So anyone that is here live or watching the recording, um, if you registered for the recording, we will send out a follow up message with all of the links from the chat. And then if for some reason you don't get that or you're watching this independently, you didn't register, totally fine. Email education at matterhackers.com and reference this recording and we'll make sure that you get that um, that email with all of the links. Um, anything else? We got a lot of love in the chat. This was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, there was one that I wanted to read um, that you're so inspiring, which of course, you know, I know this. Um, oh. I hope you have all enjoyed. Um, ah, you're doing a fabulous job for your students and this will be a long lasting, this will be long lasting self esteem. Love your work from an avid fellow avid 3D printer fanatic in the chat. Um, awesome. so thank you so much, Jesus, um, for taking your time. Um, it's been a crazy year for educators and we just appreciate all of the work that educators have done to just continue to reinvent yourselves, reinvent profession, the profession and, um, and keep students engaged and keep students learning like, you know, big, 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 big love and big hearts to all of you. Awesome. Anything Thank else you everybody this? that was here and all the questions. Thank you. All right. And that's it. Um, from. From Matter Hackers, from Jesus, from MakerBot, thank you all so much. Again, any questions, education at matterhackers.com to be in touch. And uh, we'll see you at the next inspiration session.